Good morning. Hey, that's great. I love it when people are enthusiastic in the morning, because I'm usually not, but I'll try to be this morning. Before I get started, uh, let me get a, a little bit ahead of the lights here. I just need to do one quick demographic study, and uh, I'll tell you why towards the end of my presentation. But how many people here in this room are involved in projects that have absolutely nothing to do with IT? Well, that's great. I'm glad to see that. At least it's more than 10%, which is usually about what I see. Now, I have another question for you. Why in the world would a bunch of project managers get up early in the morning on one of the hottest days in the year in Dallas, Texas, to come hear somebody talk about history? I mean, it just doesn't make any sense at all to me. But I hope I can explain to you why it's important for you to be here and why we can have some fun with it while we are here. So let's get started and see what we're going to do today. If I can get us to go forward, there we are. Okay, so this morning, for about an hour, maybe a little bit less, I'd like to explore managing projects in the late 1960s. Why the 1960s? Well, it was about that time that some amazing things happened in the way we manage project-oriented work. So we'll take a look at why and how both project management and PMI got their start, where they came from, and uh, why we're in the profession that we're in today. Why do this? Now, let me answer my own question that I asked earlier. Because if we remember the past, it helps us to look to the future. We can base the things that we see happening in the future on the past, because without a knowledge of history, we can't really have any idea of where we're going. But most of all this morning, I hope we have some fun. Uh, I've put together a presentation that I think you'll enjoy, and let's get started with it and see where we go. Uh, James Billington was the former librarian of the US Library of Congress, and he said, Unless you know about yesterday, you can't create a new tomorrow. And I really believe that he's right. So I hope that by understanding yesterday, you all in this room today will help us create a new tomorrow. So let's go back in time. 1969. Hands of those that were here. Good, good. I'm talking to an older audience. That's great. What happened in 1969? Well, if you were uh, of any age at all, you remembered exactly where you were when Apollo 11 made its first landing. A significant event, first manned mission to the moon. A real first for the United States, a real first for Texas in so many ways. So, the internet was created in 1969. Most of us think of the internet as something that just happened, that in the last two or three years, we developed this tremendous tool that's been so helpful to us and that we all live by today. But the internet had its beginning in 1969. It first went online. And here's the entire internet in 1969. There it is, folks, all four nodes. That was your internet. I looked at this map, which you can, you can find it on uh, Google. I looked at this map a, a week or so ago, and the United States is black, as are most other countries in the world. We have really come a tremendous long way since 1969. And I'd like to talk also about communications tools in 1969. Imagine for a minute, is there anybody here who doesn't have a cell phone or some communications device with them right now? I didn't think so. We rely on those things. Suppose I told you that you couldn't use a phone, a tablet, a laptop computer, could only get partial use of a desktop computer, had no fax or had no copy machines available to you. How would you communicate? The communications tools of the 1960s are one of the reasons why the project management profession got started, and certainly one of the big reasons why PMI had its birth. In 1969, we communicated 
in only two major ways. The first was the telephone, and that wasn't very efficient. You had to book a call to Europe. If you were in the United States and wanted to talk to a colleague in Germany or France, you called the telephone company and made an appointment for your call. Uh, I was in Germany in the 60s, and I remember wanting to call back to home on Christmas Day. One month ahead of time, you had to book a line sometime during the 24 hours around Christmas, or you couldn't get through. We also did a funny thing with some white stuff that was approximately that big, and we called it paper. And, and we had these funny little writing instruments, uh, pens, and we would, we would actually put words on the paper, and we would fold it up and put it into a, a strange device called an envelope, and we would uh, lick a stamp and put it in a thing called a mailbox. And two or three weeks, our friends in California would get it, and they'd open it, and they'd read it, and they'd go, nope, don't agree. And they would get out their pen and their paper. And three weeks later, you'd open your letter and see that they didn't agree. So you could get another piece of paper and write back and say, why not? And this kind of a conversation, as you can well imagine, took a long time. We were sending information back and forth in mail. We did have a thing called uh, teletype. Uh, I can remember being in my office in the early days and getting a telephone call that there was a telex message for me in the teletype room, and I'd go down 12 stories, and everybody would be excited because it was coming in from Europe. You know, these are things that we just don't even think about today. But it's this lack of the ability to communicate quickly and easily that forced a group of us to think about putting together the organization that we know as PMI today. By the way, I'm not real sure that we've gotten a whole lot better in communications. On the way out of the hotel this morning, I was waiting for a shuttle to come over here, and I noticed on the meeting board, they had the meetings for the day listed. I am telling you the truth. The first meeting was M and WTCW 3DP wrap-up. <laughs> Who? We communicate in code these days. We communicate in code because even our fast new communications devices work better if we use fewer letters and fewer characters. And we need to be able to translate that code. But we can communicate much faster than we ever could before. So, Apollo 11, internet, communications tools. What else in 1969? Well, the most important thing of all, the first PMI seminar symposia was held in October in Atlanta, Georgia. This was, of course, one of the four major events in the world in 1969. <laughs> and it was held at Georgia Tech. Uh, I know that I'm, I may be in uh, a part of the world where Georgia Tech and football are uh, at odds, but we won't even get into that. We held October the 9th and 10th, 1969, an advanced project management concepts seminar in Atlanta. And it was the, at that meeting that we decided that a project management organization needed to be started. But what was project management? And why an organization? So where did we come from? Did project management as a profession just spurt up someplace? No, not really. Uh, the little bit of research that I've been able to do to, I went back just a little way into the 1600s, 1700s, and I looked at a guy, Christopher Wren, who some of you may be familiar with. Christopher Wren was an architect and builder. He built St. Paul's in London. He also rebuilt 51 churches in the city of London following the Great London Fire. So he had to have some way of managing projects. What did he do? The best I can figure out, Christopher Wren and people like him, Tilford, uh, others that were engineer constructors in the 16 and 1700s, managed their projects on the basis of the experience of the people that worked for them. Time and cost were not very important to them. What was important was that they get a quality product finished. And they did it based on the experience of 
the people that had come before them. You hear a lot about the great cathedrals of Europe. You hear a lot about the great bridges in the United States. We know a lot about big projects that were going on in the early 18, 1900s. But nobody tells you how long they took, how much money they cost, how much time, money, and lives went into building the projects that uh, we hold as edifice of uh, a time gone by. So really, it was these people that set the foundation for the jobs that we have today and for the profession that we know as project management. Then came a guy by the name of Henry Gant. Has anybody ever heard of Henry Gant? I hope. Henry Gann, I always thought was some great European who did amazing things and who came up with some ways to look at project-oriented work that were different than anything that had been done before. But I find out he was actually a graduate of Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore. And Henry Gant worked as his first job was at Midvale Steel in Pennsylvania. And what did he really do? Well, we know him mostly for the Gant chart. And we know that, that uh, he really contributed in the early 1900s, 1910 is about when the Gantt chart was first introduced to the world. But what he did was for the first time, he looked at the projects in two dimensions. He began to look at what are the activities in a project versus the length of time that it takes to, to do those projects. Later on, as the Gantt chart evolved, he began to consider some resource considerations. But mostly, he took a two-dimensional look at projects that in the past had been managed in a single dimension. What is it that needs to be done today? Now Gantt began to look at what are all the things that have to be done against the time that we have to do them. And uh, I believe that we still use a lot of what Henry Gantt taught us. And he certainly was one of the early project managers uh, that brought about the project management profession. And then came a tipping point. The first really major change in how we manage projects since 1910. I consider it to be the birth of, project man of modern project management. And that came about by some work done at two different places at the same time. First, critical path method, CPM as some of us know it, uh, was developed by Kelly and Walker, who were uh, with Remington Rand and working on a project for DuPont. And DuPont had uh, a number of cotton fiber and textile plants, I believe in Virginia and North Carolina, uh, that they had to shut down on a routine basis because if they didn't shut the whole plant down, tear out all the filtering system, replace all of the filters, there would be enough dust collection from the cotton fibers that uh, explosion was possible. So it was very important to DuPont to be able to shut these plants down quickly, bring them back up online as quickly as possible. And they hired Remington Rand with Kelly and Walker to study how that could happen. And Kelly and Walker, both working on the project, did what I think is a really significant change to the world of project management. And that was that they began to look at projects not in two dimensions, but in three, four, and in some cases, five dimensions. Not only were we looking at activities versus time versus cost, but we were most significantly looking at the interaction of activities, how the completion of one activity impacts the start of another activity. And it's this understanding of the relationships between activities that brought modern project management into focus. At the same time, and uh, a lot of people think that uh, it really wasn't at the same time, but my study, and I've done a little bit of it, says that really, independently, by doing the same kinds of things, the US Department of the Navy, with the help of Booz Allen Hamilton, put together a team that they called the Program Evaluation Review Task Force to look at how to build uh, the uh, nuclear, or the first, uh, missile-carrying submarines, underwater-fired missile-carrying ca submarines, the Polaris Project. How did this come about? Well, I can remember on a hot summer night, much like last night, 
at Georgia Tech in Atlanta where I was a student, looking out and seeing this little light go across the sky. It turned out to be an aluminum sphere. I think, I, if I remember correctly, only about 12 inches in diameter, but you could see it from the ground. It was something the Russians had put up there, it was called Sputnik. And Sputnik scared the United States to death. It really put the fear of potential uh, war into the minds of a lot of people. And the response was Polaris, a submarine that could fire a missile from under the sea. And the uh, Department of the Navy Special Weapons with Booz Allen Hamilton put together a project to manage the Polaris project, and they called their tool that they developed uh, the Program Evaluation Review Technique. Some of us know it as PERT. So with the development of CPM, the Critical Path Method, with Kelly, and PERT with the Program Evaluation Review Technique, we had a whole new set of tools, a whole new way of looking at how project management or project-oriented work is managed. And I think it made a really true, significant change and started what we know today as the project management profession. So, with that as a background, how does all of that take us to October 9, 10, 1969 in Atlanta, Georgia? It was a bit of a long road. It actually started about 1964. And I think I have to tell you a little bit about where I was in 1964 so that you get a feel of what was going on. I was working for a pharmaceutical company in Philadelphia as a computer programmer. I was writing in machine code on a 1401 IBM computer. Tremendous, tremendous capability. We had 2K of memory. I think I got 3K in my watch, I'm not real sure. 2K of memory. But we could do things we could never do before. And then we moved up, and, and in about 1964, 65, all of a sudden I was working on something called an IBM 1410. It had 40K of memory. 10 times as much. Wow, where were, or 20 times as much. Where in the world were we going? You know, this was just tremendous. The only trouble was it required 40 tons of air conditioning and it took up a lot of space. So, I'm in my office one day, office, that's a desk with a chair behind it, uh, and uh, my boss came up to me and he said, you know, this building that we're in is the only building that this pharmaceutical company uh, has, and we do everything here. We do research, marketing, finance, manufacturing, we have raw materials coming in and out, and we don't have an appropriate way to receive and account for our materials because our loading docks are way out of date. We're going to rebuild all the loading docks. Doesn't sound like a very big project. I heard, I heard people yesterday in one of the sessions say that they, uh, they were working on billion-dollar projects. Well, this one might have cost a, uh, tens of thousands, but uh, it was a big project for us because Everything that came through that whole company went through that loading dock, and we couldn't interrupt the flow of goods and materials in and out while we completely tore it out and rebuilt it. And my boss said to me, you know, there's this new thing called CPM. Why don't you learn something about it and see if it would be useful? And I did. And I found that it really was useful. I was able to put in some activities into a diagram that allowed me to see what the interrelationships were of the work that had to be done. Allowed me to plan that work in a way that uh, was meaningful to me as well as to the people that were actually doing the work. And out of that successful project, uh, we began to try using the same tools on some other projects. Uh, like, for instance, research. And we began to look at the questions of uh, how can we better plan the long-term research projects? Pharmaceutical projects, as many of you know, take years, tens of years, from concept until you bring a product to the market. So it was very helpful to have some new tools that we could use for that. And I began uh, teaching some people in the company how to use these new tools. 
and uh, they worked very successfully. But I, I was uncomfortable because I really didn't know that much about what I was talking about. So I, uh, I went off and decided that I needed some learning experiences. And I found that Georgia Tech was offering a short course. Uh, we call it adult education or continuing education today uh, in PERT and CPM. And it was offered by Dr. J. Gordon Davis of the School of Industrial Engineering. So I went off and signed up for the course. Second day of the course, Dr. Davis comes up to me and he says, you're a ringer. I said, what do you mean I'm a ringer? He said, you know as much about this stuff as I do. I said, yeah, well, you know, I'm saying, what are you doing here? I said, well, it's really very simple. I came here to hear what you had to say, learn as much as I possibly could, and steal your curriculum so I could use it back in my company. And on the basis of that, Gordon and I became very close friends, uh, the friendship which continues today. In fact, uh, it developed that Gordon needed somebody to help him capstone his courses. At the end of the one-week course, we would have uh, a panel discussion, as we're going to have this afternoon. And the first question that always came to the panel was, where do we go from here? How do we continue to learn about these tools and other new tools that are coming along that will help us manage project-oriented work? Now, let's look, think back. This is 1964. Remember what I said about those communications tools. Remember how hard it was to convey ideas. Remember that it was almost impossible to uh, quickly and easily convey a new idea, a new way of doing work from somebody on the East Coast to somebody on the West Coast. So uh, we never had a really good answer for that in the early days. And I continued to help Gordon Capstone his projects for the next couple of years, or his uh, courses. And it, it got to the point that uh, he and his wife, Billy Davis, invited me to stay at their home in Atlanta uh, when we were doing the course. And it was here at this house in their home in Atlanta that after dinner, Gordon and Billy and I would sit around their kitchen table or dining room table or wherever in their den and talk about what are we going to do with this thing, this how do we convey these ideas that we're teaching? How do we meet the needs of people who have new ideas, who have questions, who want to build their knowledge about how to better manage projects? And uh, I understand that maybe 9.30, 10 o'clock, Billy would get bored with it all and go off and do something else, and Gordon and I would continue the discussions, and uh, maybe at 11 o'clock or 12 o'clock at night, Gordon would get tired and go off to bed, and it is alleged that I'd sit in their kitchen and talk to myself for another hour or so before uh, I finally gave up. But it was here in this house that we began to think about how do we meet the needs of people in this new, we didn't even call it a profession, then. how do we meet the needs of the people now using some new tools to help them manage their work. And we came to a very, very simple conclusion. The only way to do it would be to bring people together in a central place and talk, look at each other, exchange ideas, a unique thing. Even today, we don't do as much of that as we should. So we talked and we talked. And then something interesting happened. At SmithKline, my pharmaceutical company I worked for, um, the research planning had really caught on. We now had four or five people involved in planning research, and the science, research scientists were saying things to us, can this tool help us to determine what our staffing needs are going to be three to five years out based on the activities that we will have to be doing to meet our planned delivery of new products 10 years out? Tough question to answer in those days. And we began searching for some better tools than a 1410 computer to help us uh, answer those questions. 
And I don't know how many of you remember, there used to be a company called uh, Lockheed Aircraft in St. Louis, and they were building fighter aircraft there, and they needed to do a lot of uh, aerodynamic research. So they built a wind tunnel in St. Louis, a big one, a really big one. They had a huge computer center to support it. Uh, for those of you who remember tape drives, you remember those things with the big reels of tape and you mounted them on your computer? That was the way we stored data. And you didn't just move a file from one place to another, you moved a tape from one drive to another. At one time, McDonnell Douglas Automation Company, which grew out of the wind tunnel business, uh, had employed a number of young ladies. Uh, I don't know why they were ladies, but they employed a number of young ladies who had three-wheel bicycles and would ride around the computer center, take tape 27 to machine 86, mount it, take that tape off of that machine to, to drive number 101. And they did this all day, every day. Uh, instead of clicking and dragging, we were moving physical tape reels from one machine to another on three-wheel bicycles. We've come a long way, folks. However, those people came a very long way in developing project management. They developed a computer package uh, that they called uh, the Management Scheduling and Control System, MSCS. Is there anybody in the room old enough to remember MSCS? I think I see one of them, they're great. Tremendous program. MSCS was able to look at up to 15 resources on each activity in your network and could handle an unlimited number of activities, as long as you had enough tape drives. It was really a great program. And in the 1960s, it sold for a mere $40,000, which means that it was relatively expensive in those days. And uh, we looked at it. We looked at a lot of other systems that were available, some other programs that were available, and SmithKline and French Laboratories bought MSCS. And our salesman was a young guy by the name of Ned Engman who came from Houston, Texas, but worked out of St. Louis. And uh, Ned came with the package when we had first installed it in Philadelphia, helped us set it up, helped getting things running, and of course, we had to celebrate the successful ins installation of this new system, so we went out to dinner. And we went out to dinner in uh, 1967. It was early December in Philadelphia at a little place called the Three Threes. That was the name of the restaurant. And it took its name from where it was located. It was on Smedley Street in Philadelphia. Smedley Street, for any of you that know Philadelphia, is only one block long and runs between uh, 16th and 17th and between Spruce and Pine. Just a little one, long, one block long street, row houses on both sides. But the restaurant turned out to be quite a place. This is what it looks like today. It's no longer a restaurant. It's now a, a, a private home. Uh, it was just completely re renovated and put on the market for about a million five, something like that. I was going to buy it, but I just didn't have that much in my checking account that day. So uh, this is where we went off to, to have our, our uh, dinner. And uh, interestingly, for those of you who know something about Philadelphia, in December we can get some snow. It started to snow while we were in the restaurant. And it snowed. And I mean it snowed. And Ned Engman, being a Texan from Houston area, was not really up for snow. So as only a good Texan can do, he canceled his flight, decided to stay overnight, and ordered more wine. <laughs> and as we uh, sat in the restaurant, he looked at me and he said, you know, you and Gordon Davis ought to just quit talking about it and do something about it. For the last three or four years, you've been talking about bringing people together, about sharing ideas about how projects are managed. But you don't do anything. Let's do something. In fact, I'll help you. I'll call a meeting, and we'll sit down and begin to plan exactly when, where, and how we can have a meeting that will bring together 
the people that are interested in using these new ideas and these new techniques. However, I will not come to Philadelphia in the winter. So we'll meet New Orleans. Now you have to understand that Ned Engman's the kind of guy who if he decided on a Saturday afternoon that Brennan's would be a good place to have dinner, he'd drive to New Orleans for dinner and back the same night. I don't know how he used to do it, but he, he was you know, quite a person when it came to hitting the road for restaurants. So he decided that we should meet in February of 1968 in New Orleans and begin to put together some sort of an organization. I know exactly when that meeting was from the letter you see here, intentionally blurred so you can't see it, but part of it says, it looks as if February the 14th will be the big day. I won't believe it until we're on the plane for New Orleans. Long talked about, much pondered, ideas may soon be reality. Signed by my wife in 1968. Now, this letter was one of uh, half a dozen or so that she would do each year and send off to our family because our way of communicating was not to pick up the telephone or whip out our cell phone or any other way of communication. But remember, communications were still very difficult. So we would write a family newsletter four, five, six times a year, maybe not quite that much, and, and convey the really important things in life, like the dog died, you know, and what was going on in her family. And she wrote this letter uh, as she joined me to go off to New Orleans to begin to talk about the organization. It uh, is one of the few pieces that actually nails down dates and times when some things happened. Others we talk about in terms of months because we've forgotten the dates. And we went off to uh, New Orleans and we met at the Roosevelt Hotel. The Roosevelt Ho Hotel is an old icon. It's had uh, probably three or four different names and five or six different companies since it was built in 1923. Uh, the picture that you see here is of the hotel, was taken three, three or four years ago. So it still looks pretty much like it did uh, in 1968 when we met there to discuss a new organization. So who, who met? Ned Engman, McDonnell Douglas Automation Company, called the meeting, made the arrangements. He brought along his friend Eric Jeanette from Brown and Root here in Houston, and he brought along another friend, John King, from Bell Telephone Laboratories, who were also customers of MSCS, along with uh, me. I brought along Gordon Davis, and uh, the group of us met in what has turned out to be typical PMI tradition. We started our meetings at 7 o'clock in the morning. Why do we do these dumb things? <laughs> and we would work straight through lunch. Uh, you know, have sandwiches brought in, continue to debate, continue to talk about ideas about how to run a meeting and where it should be and who should run it and what should be there. And, and it, if you ask any one of the 40 volunteers that have helped do this meeting, uh, they will tell you that there's a lot to talk about. A lot of things have to be decided when you're planning a meeting of any size. Uh, and what came out of that meeting, we'll talk about in just a second, but I will say that uh, John King came to that meeting from Bell Labs and decided that project management would never go anywhere and uh, decided to opt out of being involved in the group after that. So uh, you, you see that we end up with four of the five founders attending that very first meeting. Engman, Jeanette, Davis, and Snyder. And here's what we looked like then. Weren't we handsome people? The uh, young lady in the middle is Susan Gallagher, who was my primary instructor and teacher for project management systems at Smith Klein and Ranch for a number of years, and went on to work for G.D. Searle, and then on to some other pharmaceutical companies in the Midwest. Uh, the rest of us, well, we didn't change too much, and in 2004, we got together for the last time, or we haven't gotten together since then, let me put it that way, and uh, as you can see, we'd all changed a little, but not that much. So this is the outstanding faces of those people who put together something that we ended up calling PMI. Uh, okay, so what did we do other than meet in New Orleans? Well, we pretty much firmly established the need 
Corps, an association to foster professionalism in project management, not just to have a meeting. But we decided that having one meeting would not be enough, that we had to continue to provide education, opportunity, and places for people to meet, talk, and exchange ideas and thoughts. And that this really uh, was based on a growing profession. And we decided it was a profession. So we wanted to bring that profession to the, to the highlight of, of others and to explain what it was we did. And that would be our major purpose. We selected the name, American Planning and Scheduling Society, because that's what we were all about. It was about planning and scheduling. We didn't talk about risk management and team building and, and all the other things that are a part of modern project management. But in those days, it was planning and scheduling. We selected a site for the first seminar to be Atlanta. And uh, as most of you know, project managers are good at appointing people to do things. Uh, Gordon and I got ganged up on and elected to be the co-chairman for the first meeting. Gordon had arranged for Georgia Tech to sponsor us. I have to tell you a little bit about this. Georgia Tech had decided that maybe we had something good going. And they had said to Gordon, look, if you want to hold a meeting here, we'll give you a place to hold it, an auditorium in one of the, the classroom buildings, School of Aeronautical and Space Engineering. Uh, we will provide all of the breaks. We'll pay for the coffee breaks for a two-day meeting. Um, we will do the registration for you, collect the, the registration fees. Um, we will make one mailing uh, from materials that you produce to everybody who has ever taken one of our short courses or one of our adult education courses. We'll, we'll mail a brochure for you. And, oh, by the way, if you make money on the, this venture, you can keep it. But if you lose money, we'll cover it. So we debated uh, probably uh, 50 milliseconds before we accepted their offer. <laughs> And it is obvious to me that if Georgia Tech hadn't stepped up with the support that they did for that very first meeting, uh, we wouldn't be calling ourselves PMI today. We would probably not exist. Now, I personally, uh, every time I speak, I like to thank the School of Industrial and Systems Engineering at Georgia Tech for their contribution to starting our organization. So. Uh, inevitably, we moved from one meeting to another meeting to finalize our agenda, and we decided to go back to New Orleans and decided, decide now not what we were going to do, but how we were going to do it. In that, at that meeting, we very quickly became aware, uh, and I think it was intuitively obvious to all of us, that there was more to what we were talking about than planning and scheduling. We also became aware that there was more than just America, that in fact the tools and techniques that we were talking about were applicable worldwide, and that in fact we would be going somewhere besides other, or someplace other than just planning and scheduling. Uh, we selected a keynote speakers and a session chair, and uh, Russell Archibald, who many of you know, I know you. Many of you have read some of his books. Russell Archibald was selected as the keynote and chair for the meeting. The speakers were selected, and we planned that advertising that we talked about. And we moved on from there. And what we moved on to was that was held in February of 1969. Our meeting was set for October. So between February and October, uh, through the old ways of communicating of telephone and letter writing and memo writing and that kind of thing. Uh, we changed the name to Project Management Institute. Uh, we solicited financial support for startup. E even with the, the help of Georgia Tech, there would still be other costs involved if we were going to continue this organization. And we got $200 from Brown and Root. And we got $200 from McDonnell Douglas. And we got $200 from Smith, Klein, and French. And on $600, I incorporated 
PMI in the state of Pennsylvania and still had $400 left over. Uh, during that period, I, I actually drafted the Constitution and bylaws and did the incorporation, uh, not for any reason other than I had the time and I had the capability and I had the support of my company to do it. So uh, in that February to October period, I undertook to do those things. And we went off to Georgia Tech. There's the first brochure, an advanced seminar in project management concepts. Cost, $65. Keynote speakers, you see them there. Many of the names are familiar to you. Uh, they, they all made contributions, and they came from different and interesting areas. Russell Archibald at the time was a consultant for ITT. Uh, David Cleland, many of you know Dave Cleland, uh, professor of project management or systems management at the University of Pittsburgh. And uh, John Fondle, who was a professor of safety engineering at, uh, in, in California, I forgot which school now exactly, uh, but John worked very hard in the early days developing systems and plans for uh, supporting construction claims for the state of California. Jim Kelly joined us, a Dr. R.L. Martino. A Dr. Martino was a consultant in the Philadelphia area who had written quite a bit on project management, and uh, we wanted him to speak. But at the last minute, he called and uh, informed us that he had hit his head on the chandelier in his office and decided that he couldn't fly to Atlanta from the Philadelphia area, so he backed out. I personally think he was yeah, pretty sure that we weren't going to make it and didn't want to, to join us. And I just, I would like to run into Dr. Martino today and just go, meh, but <laughs> I, I don't know that that'll ever happen. And uh, Schaefer joined us to uh, fill in for Dr. Martino. But there's the first brochure. That's what it looked like. And here's where we met, Georgia Tech. And the actual meeting itself was right here in the uh, Aeronautic and Space Engineering Building, which is still on the Tech campus. This, of course, is not a 1969 picture of the campus, which took up just about a third of what you see there now. But uh, that's where we held our, our first meeting. October the 9th, 10th, 1969. Now, as any good meeting planner knows, and as we all know from our experience attending seminars like this, there are some important things. And one of the important things is food. So between the two days, we decided to have a dinner and that uh, would be in addition to the registration fee, but you could sign up and, and we went to dinner uh, at a uh, a dump. Uh, it was uh, called the American Motor Hotel. The reason this is a, an Atlanta history uh, picture that I've been able to find of the American Motor Hotel is that within uh, six months after we had our dinner there, they tore a place down. <laughs> it was not what you'd call a five-star hotel. But for those of you who are at all familiar with Atlanta, you know where the Peachtree Plaza Hotel is, and the Peachtree Plaza has a motor entrance, and the motor entrance for the Peachtree Plaza is right here. So we were just behind what is now uh, one of the bigger hotels in the, in the city of Atlanta. Um, this place was bad. Uh, I, I did a, a presentation after the dinner that we had. Uh, we won't talk about the dinner. <laughs> And I called it the PMI, an organizational profile. And what I said was, are you having fun? And if you are having fun, would you like to have fun again next year someplace else? Uh, now you've heard my whole presentation. Uh, if you would like to, then why don't you join us and we're starting this art organization. And of the 70-some people who attended the first seminar symposia, 28 people came up to me after dinner and handed me a check or cash for $15 for their first year's annual dues, the PMI. We've come a long way, particularly in the cost of the dues, but uh, I won't go into that. Uh, so, we launched the organization at the American Motor Hotel in Atlanta, Georgia, on the evening of October the 9th, 1969. 
And from there, from 28 people, we've grown to the organization that we are today. Uh, I never get the numbers right, but I think we're now a membership of over 400,000 and uh, something over 600,000 uh, people hold uh, professional certifications in the organization. So, we did some dumb things in the early days. <laughs> One of them was to let a civil engineer from Houston, Texas, select the logo in the paper. <laughs> For some reason, Eric had this great desire to have our paper be khaki. And that presented a number of problems to us. Uh, the first one of which is we had to go out and place a special order for khaki out. Because if you made a mistake in those days in typing, you used something called white out to, to retype the, your spelling errors but they didn't have anything to work on this paper, so we were one of the first people in the world to have a special order for khaki out. <laughs> the logo, as you see, I sort of liked, uh, and, and we stuck with that for a while, but as times change and as we become more modern, we moved on to the logos that you're aware of today. Uh, I have to thank the first paid employee of PMI, and I'll talk a little bit about her, uh, for her diligence in typing an individual letter to everybody that joined for about the next five or six years after 1969. Uh, Karen Marinelli, who started with, with us in 1969-70 uh, as just a uh, secretarial help to greet new people and new members with a letter and to do all of our correspondence, and Karen put up with this terrible stationery for longer than I certainly could put up with it. Uh, it, was, it was a time of growth. We weren't real sure what we were doing, but we got right out of doing the 1969 seminar symposia and moved on to planning for the future. And one of the things that we recognized at the first board of directors meeting which was held uh, following the seminar symposia, was that we were in business to communicate. And if we were going to communicate, we needed some sort of a communications vehicle. So a young man by the name of Bob Staples uh, spoke up and uh, said that he would be happy to be the editor for the first PMI project management quarterly. And he wrote its first eight-page document and mailed it to our 120 members in April of 1970. And this is a copy of that first project management quarterly, stapled together and mailed off, a little bit different than the uh, material that we receive today, either in the mail or electronically, to keep up with our profession. So here we are, a, a new organization with actually with uh, employees and with people uh, joining and with plans for new meetings and with a, a mission to not only teach the people in our communities about project management, but to reach out to other communities. We were, by the way, an international organization from day one. At that first meeting in Atlanta, we had people attend from Canada and from Mexico. And on the basis of that, I declared us an international organization. And we have done nothing but grow to the point now where I think you can safely say that PMI is represented in some small way in every major country in the world. So let's take a, let's take a corporate tour because I think you'll enjoy, uh, I hope you'll enjoy, seeing how we've grown over the years and how we've developed in, in the way that we do business. So, the first corporate office was in my dining room in 1968 when I first started to do a lot of the work for, for PMI. Uh, and I, I, by the way, was the first president. Ned Engman was the first chairman. And we um, sort of just moved through the chairs in those days. Sue Gallagher was the first treasurer. Gordon Davis was the first secretary. And then we just sort of moved up through the offices. 
after I had been chairman of the board, uh, no one seemed to really want to do the day-to-day -day work that was beginning to develop. So I volunteered, and for the next 15 years, I was the volunteer executive director for PMI. And that, that meant that I took care of all the hiring and firing of our one employee <laughs> and uh, managed the post office box, post office box 43 in Drexel Hill, Pennsylvania, which is where you joined. In fact, if you looked in that box, there were a whole bunch of little people in there doing things because that was our entire office for the first few years, uh, a post office box in a little town outside of Philadelphia. So let's take a look at the first world headquarters. There it is. Karen used to come over and sit at this table with uh, her typewriter and uh, bang out the letters. Uh, this, by the way, is my dining room, and that's what it looks like today. I, I think I have changed the wallpaper and maybe the carpet, but the furniture is pretty much the same. And that's where we ran the organization for the first 15 years or so. And then we also backed that up with the uh, thousands of small volunteers who lived in post office box 43 at Drexel Hill, Pennsylvania. And that's, that's where your mail went, and that's where PMI was run from for a long time. We began to expand, and as we grew, we realized that we needed office space. So we started to look for a place, and the place that we found was uh, right here, these two offices here. Here was the door, and it was uh, just over the local meat market, and it was just next door to a very nice pub, which is still there today. The pub's name is Maggie O'Neill's today. But anyway, there we were. And the office quickly became known as over the meat market and next to the bar. <laughs> so this is the first building that PMI had outside of uh, my house, over the meat market and next to the bar. And if you run into old timers, they will tell you of visiting the over the meat market next to the bar. Uh, this is the nerve center. Uh, very lavishly furnished uh, with a couple of file cabinets and a desk and, and lots of piles of paper and things like that. Uh, the furniture came from uh, Smith Klein and French Laboratories. They didn't know they donated it, but uh, that's where it came from. <laughs> and that's a story I have to tell you a little bit more about. Uh, we were refurbishing the building at 15th and Spring Garden Street in Philadelphia, and they were replacing all of the office furniture in one section. And I went to the building management, and I said, look, you know, what are you going to do with this furniture? And they said, we're, we're, it's trash. It's, it's going out. And I said, well, cool. I have a couple of desks and some file cabinets. And they said, we'd love to give them to you, but we can't. And I said, what do you mean you can't? Well, you know, the lawyers and the accountants and the tax people and mumbled and mumbled. So I said, OK, thanks. So on a Saturday morning when they were taking the old furniture down off of my loading dock and putting it in a dumpster, I parked a trap next to the dumpster. And they put a desk in. I'd take a desk out <laughs> and loaded it on the truck. And that's how we furnished the first offices for PMI, taking furniture out of a dumpster behind a pharmaceutical company in Philadelphia. Uh, that's why I say we were lavishly furnished. PMI uh, sort of repaid the favor that Smith Klein didn't realize they did by uh, making a donation. Some of you remember communicating with people in Building 19 on Campus Boulevard in Newtown Square, which was a overflow building from a building I'm going to show you in a minute. Uh, and when we moved out of that building into the building that we're currently in, again, there was new furniture and nothing to do with the old. And uh, there is a very large uh, retirement community uh, near the PMI offices called Maris Grove. And they were in need of furniture for their woodworking shop and their chess club and this kind of thing. So we loaded up a truck and delivered the furniture to Maris Grove. So I feel that even though Smith Klein uh, doesn't know that they donated furniture to us, we have to sort of repay the favor by making the donation that we did. This is our corporate IT department. <laughs> Uh, some of you are in that thing called IT, yeah, but this was it. I mean, uh, hey, this was state of the art. 
is there anybody here who ever operated a Selectric typewriter and did you take a week-long course <laughs> to be certified to operate this uh, far advanced piece of machinery? But that's where all the letters came from. And that was Karen's great love because her little manual royal typewriter sort of wore out on the work that we were doing, our first IT department. And we moved from over the meat market and next to the bar because we were expanding tremendously, and we moved into what we affectionately call the apartment. Uh, the first office was here. Within six months, we had expanded enough that we took over this office here. Uh, within a year, we had rented a basement apartment behind these two offices. Within a year and a half or two years, we had rented an apartment on the first floor I, uh, one of these two upstairs here, and within two years we had rented every apartment in the building except one. And it was, it was sort of interesting because you went into this small apartment and all the building and all the doors were open and people were running about from one apartment to the other because that's, that's where our offices were located. Now there were two things that drove us out of the apartment. The first was that we were growing very, very rapidly. This was at the time that we had just started to do certification, and PMI was growing not only in membership, but in staff. And we needed more space than this place could offer. But the real reason was the one remaining apartment. There was an older lady there who cooked cabbage every day. <laughs> and it was either move or learn to eat cabbage every day. So we moved. <laughs> and what we did was to buy the first building that PMI ever owned. And that was 120 State Road in Upper Darby, Pennsylvania. And this is what it looks like, looked like when we were there and uh, when we moved in. We, of course, in typical PMI fashion, uh, we underestimated what we needed for space. And within the first year of being there, we had totally outgrown this building. I mean totally. Uh, there were two secretaries that I remember that, uh, you know what a secretary is? That's a person who helps somebody else get their work done. Uh, we don't have many of those today. Uh, we're all tasked with getting our own work done. And we have the capability to do that with the communications devices that we have now. But anyway, these two young ladies had to agree when they would come to work within 10 or 15 minutes of each other because they both couldn't get into their desks at the same time. If one, one had to come in and get to her desk, then the other one would come in because if the second woman came in first, the first woman couldn't get to her desk. It was that tight. It was just unbelievable. And that's when PMI hired uh, its first, no, I take that back, its third uh, executive director, Virgil Carter, and Virgil is the one who moved us out of this place and into one of our much more permanent buildings. So, our first real building, 120 State Road, Upper Darby, Pennsylvania. Moving on. We then built uh, our first building, Building 1 at 4 Campus Boulevard. And uh, this building was uh, very interesting in that it was designed, this is the building, it was designed that a, another building uh, of the same size could be built right next to it and connected through an atrium. And we figured that three to five years, we would start the planning for the second building. So three to five months later, we started the planning for the second building. <laughs> uh, this building was built in 1997. Uh, that was a year I retired. So I've been retired for a while. Uh, and when I retired, uh, Virgil came to me and asked if, uh, if I'd be willing to be the, uh, the company's representative on the construction site. And I just jumped at it because I really like to manage projects. And small projects are a lot of fun. You can do a lot of things with a small project you can't do with a larger project. Uh, for instance, you can implement certain risk management and uh, change order kinds of work that don't occur in larger projects. 
our change order system was very simple. I walked through the construction site every night with a construction supervisor who carried a sledgehammer. And if he didn't like the way the work looked, he hit it. So an electrician may come in and find that a panel had just been knocked off a wall because it wasn't where it was supposed to be. Uh, and that's the way he managed change orders, which uh, sometimes I think is the way we ought to uh, manage more of our change orders today. Um, so we built the second building. And uh, the total building looked like this. I, I don't know whether anybody here that's ever been there. One or two hands, I'm sure. PMI staff, I'm sure, of course, that may be here know that. But it's a very functional, functional building, which, of course, we outgrew within two or three years of its completion. It's now available. If anybody would like to lease it, PMI still owns the building, and uh, we'd be quite happy to lease it to you. Uh, so see me after the meeting. Uh, we went from here to another building on this same office complex, which is uh, what we know today. And that's uh, number 14, Campus Boulevard. This is your current PMI corporate headquarters. Uh, we have a unique solution to outgrowing this one. You take offices and cubes away and let people just work at tables. And I'm told that the, the current generation uh, likes to do things like sit cross-legged in the halls with a laptop and, and work that way. And I, I find, having sat cross-legged next to some of them, they really do like to work that way. So to all of you who enjoy uh, working just sort of wherever and hanging out in a building, this is a, a good place to work. I personally like the privacy of an office, and I think it does help creativity, as we heard yesterday in the talk about how our brains work. Uh, I'm pretty happy with this building. Uh, I go there frequently. Uh, they try to keep me out, but I have a key to the door, so they can't. <laughs> and uh, I, I'm known for, in the summertime particularly, arriving in, uh, in shorts with uh, no socks and flip-flops and uh, just wandering in, sitting down next to people and saying, what is it that you do? Uh, which keeps me up with what they're doing and keeps them up with what I'm interested in. So I do enjoy doing that part of it. There are a couple of other little side issues that I'd like to add here. First, um, I'm always asked about, when did you get involved with the academic world? And I have to say, right from the very beginning. PMI was not only interested in communicating the knowledge that we have today, or at that time, to other people. Uh, we were interested in fostering the growth of new, exciting, and innovative tools and techniques of moving the profession forward. And you can see our early involvement in that Gordon Davis, one of the founders, was from Georgia Tech. David Cleland from the University of Pittsburgh. Lynn Stuckenbrock, University of Southern California. John Fondle, Stanford, that's what I couldn't think of earlier, and Dr. David C. Murphy from Boston College. Now, he's the one who took the job of the first real editor of the Project Management Quarterly and took it from an eight-page mimeograph. Remember mimeograph? That's that stuff that uh, marijuana replaced. You could go into a closet and make 100 copies and come out happy for the rest of the day. Uh, so... Uh, Dave Murphy took it over and made the uh, quarterly into a professional journal and carried it for a number of years, producing it at Boston College. PMI's Educational Foundation, uh, which was started uh, primarily as the, or is, the nonprofit arm of PMI, the charity, if you will, uh, offering the scholarships that you all know about. And if you don't, and you have college age, uh, Sons and daughters, please look at it. There are a lot of scholarships available for uh, people who uh, are interested in studying project management in one form or another. The Educational Foundation was also, is also a big supporter of the university systems through grants and uh, other ways of encouraging people to study project management. Uh, they have helped build some of the bigger libraries that we have available with project management information. 
I can say that I was always very academically interested in, in the subject of managing projects. I wrote a thesis for my master's degree. Back in those days, you had to actually write something to get a master's degree. And uh, my thesis was on where project management should be located in an organization, which is another whole story. However, at that time, I read every book that was published on the subject of project management and liked both of them. And uh, <laughs> it, uh, this involvement has just grown with the organization, and I hope it continues to grow today. Um, I, I think that there's probably one other area that is extremely important to say a few words about, and that would be to talk uh, about volunteers. Uh, PMI is a volunteer organization. Yes, we have paid staff. Of course we do. You have to when you're as large as we are. But for the most part, all of the chapter activity, all of the really important work that goes on down at the level of project managers themselves is done by volunteers. And I'd like to personally thank every volunteer here in this room who put this meeting together, as well as those who participate in the, in the local chapter here and keep the organization going. They're the backbone of PMI. Uh, let me just take... <laughs> let me just take two more minutes. Uh, and uh, then we'll have time for a couple of questions. But um, where are we going? We haven't yet solved the problem of communication. I asked earlier about cell phones. And it turned out everybody here in this room has some sort of cell phone or communications device with them today and you're using about one-tenth of one percent of the capacity, capabilities of that device that you have. As project managers, we have got to learn to use better the tools that we have now. Use better the tools that we have now. How many of you hold a project team meeting at which someone sits with a cell phone recording verbally the progress that's being reported on a project, and that information automatically updates a network-based project plan in the computer somewhere, which updates a portfolio, which updates a corporate project planning system. There are so many more things we could do with what we have. Let's make use of the tools we have today. I think we're going to see new tools, and we're going to see a new profession. We see it changing now. Uh, one of the things that I don't like about what I see now is that we tend to be moving away from the basics. Now, I'm not suggesting that for every project that every one of you are responsible for, that you take a week or a month or a half a year if you need it and draw an old-fashioned PERT diagram. But I am suggesting that you better have a network-based project plan somewhere for any major project that you're working on, because the tipping point was not how many new forms we could design, or how many more meetings we could schedule, or how many more checklists we could go through. But the tipping point in the project management profession was our ability to view projects in multiple dimensions, be able to look at the interaction between activities, to describe those activities in, time, in terms of their time, their resources and their interaction with other projects. Let's all think a little bit about going back to basics, because I think we really, really do need to do that. We have increased productivity, but that has come along at a time when the project complexity has really changed the way we do things. Uh, let's look back at that tipping point. Let's look back at the emergence of PERT and CPM in the Cold War and that era that forced us to think about how we do project-oriented work. Uh, one other thought that I'd like to leave with you for the future is that why we do things matters, but it only matters if we team that up with the experiences that we've gotten from the past. And most of all, I think we, we need to begin to start a culture shift. We need to start worrying about 
what is right in project management rather than who is right. We have got to stop using project planning and project teams as a way to evaluate personnel and start using them as a way to run projects. If we begin to do those things, you'll find that the tools we already have are extremely, extremely powerful. And finally, if we look at who the real founders were, it's these three people. Because without their support, none of us would be here today. Billy Davis, Ann Snyder, and Dodgenette, who supported us all the way along the way in project management. Thank you very much. Now it's your turn. I think I have, what, maybe five, five minutes, a couple questions. Uh, anybody? I'm, I'm open for anything. <laughs> Hey, just uh, wanted to thank you for taking the time uh, to come and speak to us today. It uh, meant a lot to me, and uh, thanks for founding, uh, being one of the founders of the PMI. Well, thank you uh, very much. I sure as heck have enjoyed doing it. Glad to be a part of it. Thank you. A uh, question I had, and I've been wondering about for a long time. If PMI founded in 69, did they leverage any knowledge from NASA? Because they seem to have embraced project management pretty heavily on the uh, space programs. Yes, absolutely. Uh, it, it's not uh, a coincidence that Eric Jeanette was a strong supporter. Uh, Eric was more invo involved in the oil and gas industry, but coming from Houston, Texas, he was also very much aware of what went on at uh, NASA in the early days. And uh, if you remember back uh, to those days, you remember that we were glued to the television set uh, when a new rocket was launched for whatever purpose, and halfway through the day you'd get a, there's a hold. And we will tell you shortly how long the hold will be. And within 15 or 20 minutes or a half hour, they'd come back and say, we have a two and a half hour hold. How did they arrive at two and a half hours? They went to a master plan and said, this has gone wrong. These are the activities that we have to perform to get back on track, and they looked at an old-fashioned PERT diagram. The Department of the Navy, of course, when it developed the Polaris Missile Project, was quick to share it with the other branches of the service, and NASA was certainly the very first to pick it up. It also is uh, important to note that our third meeting, our third Congress, was held in Houston, Texas, and at that time we were all offered a trip to go to NASA and see the uh, mission control room which in those days was exciting. I've seen pictures of it since, you know, with computers that were, you know, <laughs> desktop uh, monitors that were huge things, uh, rows and rows of them. Uh, but yes, uh, we learned a lot from NASA, and NASA, I think, learned something from us. A large group of the, the uh, project managers in the Houston chapter in the early days were, were NASA people. Anybody else? I'll be around if you'd like to ask questions. I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you very much. I enjoyed speaking with you this morning. Yeah. Thank you. you know, being an old gray-haired guy like you, I lived through a bunch of that stuff, and you brought back a lot of memories, <laughs> most of them good. Good. Well, I'm glad to hear that. But it does remind us of an old saying that I've had for years, and, and I read it. I don't know who said it, but it said, those who fail to learn from history are doomed to repeat it. Absolutely. And I think yeah. this is yeah. a good reinforcement Absolutely. of that. And thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you.